Those seven areas that I find most important are sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, our thought and mindsets, our relationships, and then living a sense of purpose. All these seven things, if I were to leave something, if people understand those seven things, you could really audit your life and become your own doctor. But when I work with my clients, just that alone, just going through and auditing their life in those seven areas shifted their health in a very, very big way. Dr. Kian Vu is a triple board certified MD who specializes in human optimization and regenerative medicine. He is the host of the Thrive State podcast and the best selling author of Thrive State Your Blueprint for Optimal Health, Longevity, and Peak Performance. Kiev, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me this morning. It is great to finally have you. I can't believe it's taken so long. And you know what you practice is so interesting. You are a thought leader in the field of performance and longevity medicine. And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So how, how do you define performance and longevity medicine? Oh, that's a great question. Well, it's really the state of when our cells are functioning at their best. And the side effect we get when our cells are at optimal state is that our cells live much longer. The telomeres are preserved. Uh, and when our cells live longer, guess what we do also? You know, when our cells are functioning at our best, so do our tissues, so do our organs, so do our organ systems. And guess what? They make up who we are, our mental and nervous system, our cardiovascular system, our musculoskeletal system. And so when we're looking at those systems performing at their our, our very best, we want our cells to as well. You know, uh, maybe we can get into the story, but uh, I'm a medical doctor that didn't used to be well. And it was my... Um, my uh, really desire to find true wellness. And when I reversed the chronic diseases I had, you know, I wasn't looking for longevity and performance, but guess what? When you live your life in such a way where you can sh shun off chronic disease, that end result that you have is living a long time, living with energy, living with vitality, and living with peak performance so that you can give more of yourself to the rest of the world. I love it. Well, let's let's go there. Let's talk about your journey. Uh, absolutely. Well, I mean, the journey would be incomplete if I didn't talk about uh, coming to America as a refugee. You know, I was born uh, shortly after the Vietnam War. My parents were basically forced to escape Vietnam on this refugee boat with 2,000 other refugees. I was an infant then. You know, I have a 17-month-old daughter now, and I was roughly her age when I was on the boat. and We were crammed like sardines. I should send you the pictures. I was the only infant to survive that, that boat journey. You know, a lot of them fell off the boat or they had dysentery. I did also, fortunately. I, I made it. We spent, enough, we spent eight months on that boat. We spent three months in a Philippine refugee camp. And then we, and then we were sponsored to America by a Catholic church. Uh, and one would think as a kid, I would be so grateful to have survived this experience, to live in the land of opportunity. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, growing up here, I would watch TV and see people that didn't look like me. I was bused to a, a more affluent area for school, and I was constantly being teased for the holes in my hand-me-down clothes, for the stinky food my mom sent me to school with. You know, I got a lot of these, go back to your home country, chinky, a lot of those messages. And I just remember, you know, I, I didn't really love myself, and I didn't um, enjoy who I was. I wanted to be taller, I wanted to be whiter, I wanted to live in a better neighborhood, all these things, I just didn't want to be me. And I realized that that, that seed left me with something that really, you know, grew into chronic disease later on, you know. So throughout my life, I was always chasing, chasing something on the outside to make me feel better on the inside. You know, I had actually wanted to do media and entertainment when I was a child, but number one, I didn't know any martial arts and there was definitely no, no, no Asian person on TV who didn't know any martial arts. Uh, but my mom was like, look, you know, we didn't travel across the world uh, and, and survive this journey for you to become an entertainer. No, you're, 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 I'm going to give you three options. And she said, you could be a doctor, an MD or a physician. And so I ended up going into medical school. But again, 
inside of me, I, I needed something on the outside to make me feel better. So I was constantly chasing, constantly striving. And for me in medical school, it was, you know, going for, for, for one of the, the top, you know, um, specialty programs there were interventional radiology, which is basically a specialty that uses medical imaging to do minimally invasive procedures. Um, I trained at the National Institutes of Health. I trained at UCLA. I trained at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And all this chasing, chasing, chasing. Five or six years into me being an attending, I find myself, uh, I thought I, I had it all. I had all the things that were supposed to make me happy. A fancy house, a fancy car. I was flying around the world, giving these fancy medical speeches. I was chief of interventional radiology at my hospital. Um, but Jason, at that time, I was overweight. I was diabetic. I had high blood pressure. I was on prescription medications. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't like the man I'd become. And I realized one thing that medical school didn't teach me how to be well. Um, in fact, later on, I learned that, you know, the culture of medical school was actually very um, antagonistic to wellness. And so I did, did a very deep dive, learning nutrition for the first time, believe it or not, as an MD, learning about epigenetic genetics, doing some functional and integrative medicine, learning with spiritual shamans. And as I started to get those tools, I actually reversed all my conditions in a matter of six months. That's amazing. Chronic disease in America is climbing at such an alarming rate. And the fact that just waking up and living a more conscious life, if I was able to do that, that's amazing. And again, not only did I reverse those conditions, but the side effect of reversing those conditions are optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. I, I love it. It's such a powerful story. And, you know, we're mind, body, green. It's all connected. One word. Mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, and environmental well-being. And when we tend to have conversations around longevity, we go straight to the physical you know, what are you doing to optimize your, your, how the way you're working out? What supplements are you taking? What are you optimizing around diet? You tend not to go to the, uh, the mental, emotional, and spiritual. But I, I think what's so interesting about your story is, look, it, it is all connected, but we tend not to look at the mental, spiritual, and emotional being the cause of possible negative effects with regards to the, the physical and the environmental, like other aspects of well being. And it seems like, from what I'm gathering from your story, is once you kind of took care of yourself mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, not that the rest fell into place easily, but, but that's where it started for you. Yeah, it definitely started. And I have to tell you, Jason, that it did fall together very easily. And if, you know, people pick up, my book, Thrive State, it's all about that. It's it's about those things that you talked about. Physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual are all energetic and they all connect with each other. And in my book, I actually talk about how each one of these things creates molecular changes in our body. They change our hormones up. They change certain growth factors, certain transcription factors. And all of these things are energetically connected and energetically speak to our DNA in a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And there's no... There's no, um, you know, there's no change that you can make in each one of those five areas that don't, doesn't change something else. So it's just, let's just say your emotions are off. Well, let's go to physical, the sleep, the nutrition, and the movement. If you were to sleep better, guess what? Your emotions, you know, suddenly are better and, and, you're, and you're starting to think better thoughts. Okay. Well, what if you start eating better, getting rid of the inflammatory foods? Guess what? Your emotions are also better and you're thinking better thoughts. Um, what about moving? Yes, moving makes you feel great. You get the endorphins going on your body and it will affect your emotional state. Take, take it around. Let's just say your mental state and your thoughts. We can't control the 70 to 80,000 thoughts that go through our mind and most of them are negative, but we can't control this. We can control the flashlight we put onto the thoughts and which thoughts we want to actually take in. And when we start focusing on things that are empowering, we start to change the way we feel. We start to change the way we feel. Oh my gosh, now I want to give more of my gift to the world. Now I, I am more abundant and not less, you know, uh, in, in a scarcity mind. So all those things are connected and all those things are connected also at the biological and molecular level. 
I think what what I think what I do is pretty cool because I think for centuries we've all known that emotional health, spiritual health, all affect our health. Um, but when people talk about it, they're like, "Oh, this is really woo woo stuff." In my book, I actually talk about regions in our DNA that are affected by those areas. So the woo woo now has gotten to be very scientific and that that that's the cool part for so, so for anybody who needs scientific proof that those things affect our health please read my book Thrive State. Well so I, I'm curious someone walks into your office their goal is longevity health span if you will and before you you know what does that conversation look like when you're trying to assess someone's emotional and spiritual well-being what what are the questions you're asking how, how do you how do you think about that oh that's a great question and, and that's why i spend so much time with each client um but uh you know many people come in they're like you know what i, I just want to get a little bit more energy i've got some weight to lose or you know i'm you know just like you i was you know i'm, I'm diabetic and and i've got this gut and, and and i'm not the ceo i once was so i get a lot of that and so a lot of people just want to feel better. They want to get that edge, but they didn't realize that just like me, I've always wanted to have that edge, but it was deeper wounds um, of not feeling like I was enough and, and, and healing those and clearing those that I was able to get to be my best. So that wasn't necessarily a first conversation, like going deep, you know, in, in, into, um, into, you know, inner child work or, or, or those deeper wounds. That's the superficial level want. And I think in order to, to reach a lot of people, you've got to reach them where they're at and reach them, you know, and, and paint a picture of a vision for them of, of, of the state that they want to be in of where they're at. But the, the questions that ultimately lead to, um, uh, uh, you know, spirituality and, and lead to their emotions is just finding out parts of the day. And where are they, what are their emotions during the day? Are they stressed out? Are they angry? You know, who are they reacting to? And then lastly, you know, asking, asking, um, asking their big whys, what's happened to this spirituality? You know, I want to do this because I want to leave this legacy. I, and I'm really passionate about this. And, and you can, you, you, you can normally tease out the people who are doing things just to make a lot of money um, and willing to kind of knock other people you know, through um, uh, to get what they want or people who are generally interested in, in, in really kind of elevating humanity. But you, you get that you know, sense of spirituality when you find out their whys. And I think over the course of the work, it's amazing that once you start to shift the physical and the emotional, you have now more access to the why. You shift from a place of, wow, you know, these are multimillionaires, eight figures, nine figure uh, people coming to me. And, and their why start to shift when they're, again, when, when all those energies are connected. And when you start to address some of them, you start to open things up. You know, you start to go from a, wow, I am uh, hurt. There's this hole in me and I need to chase, chase, chase to, I'm feeling really good. These are my gifts. I want to give, give, give. Um, so it's an amazing transformation. And you don't get that off the first visit. It, it takes a little bit of time as you're addressing each one of those things that we, we talked about. So I know you're familiar with, with Dan Buettner, Blue Zones. You know, they're the, the pillars of Blue Zones. And so what I'm curious, you know, in, in your practice, what are your pillars? Like what are the commonalities of high-performance, successful people that you see who are really optimizing for longevity? What are some of those commonalities, those qualities of people who are doing everything right? What are they doing? What can we learn from them? Well, great question. Well, I find a lot of people that come to me were, were very much like me. And there's a quote from the Dalai Lama that, um, that I find, you know, many of us resonate with. He was asked, uh, what do you found most interesting about humanity? And he said, man, because he would sacrifice his health in order to make money. And then sacrifices money to recuperate his health, and so it just led us to believe that there's there's a core wound in so many people, and that core wound has driven this quote unquote success that people are chasing for, and not only you know and 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 it's it, it's about really healing within and living as your true self that 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 like brings people back to health. And when I studied the blue zones, you know, I, I did a uh, a fellowship. Um, 
and got board certified in anti-aging and regenerative medicine uh, after I got my interventional radiology specialty. Uh, and I learned a lot of cool stuff. I, I learned hormone optimization uh, is, is great for longevity. I, I've learned about stem cells and exosomes. And there's so many additional technologies that are out there in the longevity space. It's really, really exciting. But when we look at where people live the longest, the blue zones, Dan Boitner, as you, as you pointed out, we're talking about Costa Rica, Okinawa, Sardinia, Loma Linda, Icaria, Greece. They didn't have access to any of these technologies. No wearables, no, uh, you know, no advanced testing, no stem cells, no hormone optimization. But they're the ones outliving us. So what's it telling us? Could there be something from how they are living their life that's turning on the biology of longevity? And, you know, uh, in, in the blue, book, The Blue Zones, they, they pointed out nine things. They called it the power nine. And these were the, the things that people, you know, shared in common. Uh, you know, it was uh, not eating uh, a full diet. You know, it was purpose. It was having a tribe and community. It was maybe celebrating with a little bit of wine, you know. Uh, moving naturally, things like that. And a lot of that was, uh, you know, uh, associated studies. Like these are the nine things that stood out and there's an association with these nine things to, to longevity. And what I did was I took things a step further was to analyze. I took the nine things they talked about in the book. And I also looked at others, uh, lifestyle factors and, and saw what, changes actually made a difference in areas of DNA that were most associated with disease and longevity. One were telomeres. So um, Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for her work in telomeres. And telomeres are basically these base pairs at the end of our DNA that protect our DNA from fraying every time a cell divides. So the more our, you know, if your telomeres are preserved, uh, those cells live longer. If those telomeres are short, every time a cell divides, you start to lose some genetic information, right? And what, what, what have we found? We found that sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, our thoughts and mindsets, relationship, and again, the sense of purpose or eudaimonic happiness leads to a preservation in telomeres. Okay. Well, that looks pretty similar to those power nine. And then there's another uh, genetic sequence called the conserved transcriptional response to adversity, CTRA. This is almost like the stress or danger response. You know, it's, it's basically a cluster of genes that were, there were about a hundred or so genes that are inflammatory, that codes for our immune system. And basically when this thing is turned on, it basically increases inflammation and it will lower our immune system as a response to stress. And guess what? What are the things that affect the CTRA? Well, Sleep, nutrition, movement, all those things that we talked about, emotional, social, spiritual, uh, physical, all these things affected the CTRA. And basically, that's what I talk about in my book is those seven areas that I find most important are sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, our thought and mindsets our relationships, and then living a sense of purpose. All these seven things, you know, I, I think, you know, part of the work that, that I would find to be most beneficial to, to you know, if, if I were to leave something, if people understand those seven things, you could really audit your life and become your own doctor. This is something I did not get in medical school, but when I work with my clients, just that alone, just going through and auditing their life in those seven areas, shifted their health in a very, very big way. And certainly, you know, with the people who live a little bit, who are a little bit older, uh, who want to start to get into hormone optimization and some of the other fancy stuff, I do that as well. But I got to say the, the majority of my work is really focusing on how somebody's living their life and how you live your life is medicine. I love it. I love it. And I do want to get into some of that fancy stuff. Before I get there, I guess this is somewhat fancy. You know, when you mentioned stress, sleep, is a metric heart rate variability resting heart rate if i'm if i'm to gauge you know 
how am I managing stress? Like my nervous system is heart rate variability. You know, I'm wearing my, all my trackers, I'm wearing my aura, my whoop. Is, is that one metric we should pay attention to? Yeah, absolutely. Heart rate variability is a, is, is a marker for a parasympathetic state. So um, the, the, the greater variance you have in your heart rate variability, it means that you are more connected to, to your parasympathetic. And we want that because parasympathetic is really that state of, of healing. Again, that stress mode, that's fight or flight stress mode. We need it there for actual running away from a saber tooth tiger or, or like, you know, falling off a car, you know, or something like that. Your body needs to respond to that. However, you know, in modern day society, we are so, um, we get alerted so, so easily, you know, whether it be a, 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 a somebody leaving a comment that you don't like on, on, on your Instagram or somebody cutting you off on the freeway, your bot, you know, you reacting to that basically means you're telling your body, there's a saber tooth tiger behind you. And if you think that there's a saber tooth tiger behind you, like the majority of your day, you're going to increase the inflammatory markers that go through. That's how I was living my life as a doctor. Um, until I, I started to, to build more awareness in my life. Uh, but yes, that, that that's a great marker. Uh, I would probably say with wearables, a lot of those ver- wearables are, or I would say 70% accuracy. So use them as a good marker. Don't, don't look at them and say, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't hit uh, you know, my, my target goal and then stress out because that, that it ultimately defeats the purpose of that if, if you're getting more stressed by, by looking at your numbers. And so, yeah, I agree. They're directionally accurate. Um, and so in terms of some of the, you know, more cutting edge, fancier therapies, if you will, you know, there, there's stem cell, there's gene therapy, there's hormones, but let's talk about those and, and sort of what you're seeing and the potential, maybe, maybe start with hormone therapy. Yeah. You know, a lot of the work that is done by a, a few age management societies have suggested that, um, uh, you know, having your hormones optimized, you know, typically to the levels that we are when we were younger actually are protective against age related diseases, including cardiovascular disease, including strokes and things like that. Um, you know, women who go through menopause, for example, uh, have a, you know, all of a sudden all their, their major hormones drop after menopause and they're actually put at a increased risk for cardiovascular, uh, disease, uh, because of that, however, if you start to replace your hormones within ten years of menopause, you actually preserve and you actually live longer um, because they are cardioprotective. And so, what we're seeing uh, in men is replacing their testosterone levels as as they dip during andropause, and and there's there's no defined time for that. Men are actually losing some some of their testosterone a little bit, you know, beginning at the age of thirty, uh, one to two percent a year. And it will accelerate if you're living a poor lifestyle, it will plummet even further. Uh, for women, we, we do have the mark of, of menopause. So that's what we know there. So, um, you know, hormone optimization, bio, bio-identical hormone optimization is, is something that's, you know, basically the cornerstone of a lot of anti-aging practices. And it's really important for, uh, for people to understand that there's a difference between some of the hormones that, you know, general practitioners offer uh, to patients uh, out there because of the pharmaceutical ones that are not bioidentical, meaning they, they just mimic uh, what your hormones look like. Uh, they usually come from animals uh, and animal urine and things like that. Those hormones are typically uh, associated with, you know, really bad effects, including you know, clotting and things like that. When we're talking about bioidentical hormones, these are coming from plants, but they mimic exactly the hormone you have in your body. Um, so I asked you, Jason, if you were low in vitamin D, would you replace vitamin D? Uh, many people would say yes. And so if you're low in, in other very crucial hormones for your body, would you replace it? There, there are camps that say yes, uh, because I feel a lot better and I'm one of those camps. And then there are other people, understandably so, that say, hey, you know what, this, this is a natural decline in life. I would prefer not to take something like that. And that's okay too. Interesting. So where do you, hormone specifically, like where do you think that is going in the next year? So it sounds like people are a little bit torn on whether it's the right approach. You think we'll have more clarity in the next year or so? Yeah, I would probably say, um, you know, 
a lot of good data is out, you know, in with bioidentical hormones only because uh, people have been on them now for decades. And so we're, we're getting a lot of longer term data on, on that. Um, and the, you know, uh, and the risk profile of bioidentical hormones are excellent. Uh, it's, it's, it's much better than, than a lot of these drugs that people are taking as they are, as they're entering later age. You know, I would much rather take bioidentical hormones than match what my body's already making than taking, you know, than needing to take maybe drugs, for example, if, uh, you know, you know, if I happen to pick up a symptom for whatever reason, you know, that, that potentially a lack of hormones have, have, have it accelerated that process. And what about stem cells? Ooh, yeah. So stem cells is a very, you know, touchy topic. Yes. <laughs> I would probably say there is, um, you, know, you know, stem cells are not a panacea. So w- let's just talk a little bit about what stem cells are. Well, stem cells are basically these cells that we have in our body. Now, at, when we were younger, these stem cells are very, very active. You know, they basically go to the, you know, to areas of the body and they give instructions um, to help grow and to help heal. And if there's any injury in the body, you know, stem cells hone to areas that are injured and secrete basically information through these small little vesicles called exosomes, and they will help promote healing. Um, so there's some regulations in the United States that uh, don't allow certain cell types to be used uh, in the body. They're not allowing people to uh, expand uh, cells uh, to deliver that for treatment. And so a lot of people are going to different countries for doing so, but just wanted to explain what a stem cell is and what exosomes are. And so what, what, have, what have people used these for? Well, people have used them in areas where there are injury so that you know cells can kind of come in and start to do what they're supposed to do, which is help the healing process. Uh, some people are taking these these cells and products uh, IV, uh, and they're they're no you know and for longevity purposes, thinking that you know the information that we have in these cells can reduce inflammation and combat you know the the um, the toxins of life, so to speak. Uh, and they're relatively new, and right now not as regulated as as it would seem. We hear stories from celebrities um, going to. Um, you know, going away, uh, you know, we, we saw Joe Rogan or sorry, Mel Gibson on Joe Rogan's podcast where he took his 90 year old dad to get some stem cells and, you know, he fixed his hip without needing surgery. Uh, Tony Robbins talks about getting stem cells in his shoulder, um, that basically alleviated a lot of the pain. So we have a a lot of anecdotal stories saying that stem cells help. And so I think there's definitely a role for it. I think we need to be a little bit more regulated and start to define. And there's a lot of different types of cell types that are out there that are acting in this way. And to lump everything and saying, oh, okay, this is a stem cell and that's the only thing that that's there. That's really not it. There's so many different cell types. There's cell types um, that people are getting from placental tissue from um, from uh, umbilical cord tissue some some stem cells harvested from fat some stem cells harvested from bone marrow and so it's you know it's it's kind of the wild west out there but I think as um, as as more and more research is out there we could you know really really define you know good indications for it know the risks uh, for it um, but right now it's it's a bit of the wild west yeah, I, I think well said. It is the wild, wild west in terms of stem cells. Specifically, I, I think a lot of it's happening in Utah when you said wild west. <laughs> uh, w- what about gene therapy? Yeah, exciting stuff. Um, not my um, m- not my forte, but there's certainly a lot of um, uh, technology out there. One called CRISPR that that's able to actually, you know, we have we have basically you know, our DNA. And, you know, for some people, if you've got a couple of base pairs that are off, it really changes the, the function of certain proteins. And the fact that we can actually go into the DNA and, and switch that up so that you can actually um, have a, a functioning protein that will cure that disease, that's, been, that's pretty amazing. And there's a lot, you know, in mouse models that demonstrated, you know, a cure to blindness, um, uh, and things like that. So I think it's very, very promising. And uh, 
You know, well, I, I would probably say that the genetic diseases uh, that are out there are small, but it's still a very, very, you know, important tool for, for us to have in our tool belt, to have in our tool belt. I would still have to say the majority of disease that we have um, that, that's out there worldwide today are self-inflicted and are lifestyle based. So the last one that comes up quite a bit, longevity circles, metformin. What's your take on metformin? Ah, uh, great question. Um, you know, it, it's gone, you know, up and down. I uh, take it on occasion only because I've had a history of, of diabetes. Yeah, it's a diabetes drug. But people, isn't it like insane to you? It's like, what? This is a diabetes drug. People take it for longevity now. Yeah, exactly. Well, one thing we, we do know when it... Um, uh, when it comes to longevity, when it comes to performance, is that if we're able to stress our body a little bit and give our body a little bit of horm what we call hormesis, our body tends to respond in such a way that uh, makes us better. You know, and this goes, for example, you know, when we do fasting, right? We stress our body, and and it turns on these these pathways. Uh, you know, one namely is autophagy, where we clean up all the intracellular junk in our body and renew them. Uh, we know that that's le led to longevity. Um, and so we, we know that we, we do certain things when we, you know, expose to ourselves to, to, to extreme heat or cold, there's benefits to our body. Um, and what uh, metformin does is it works on the AMPK pathway and it basically turns off the nutrients. Um, it basically makes your body think that there's no nutrients going on and it, and it activates your body to to use energy more efficiently and to produce more energy and so um uh that has been uh touted as a way of you know giving hormesis um in, in the body and so i use it you know kind of on and off only because i had had a history of diabetes i haven't noticed that I notice much in terms of my blood sugar levels or sort of my energy levels now that I, you know, w when I'm on and off of it. Um, you know, we know David Sinclair uh, will um, will use metformin. He says he has a history of diabetes that, that runs in his family. And then, you know, there there are people that, that then say, oh, if you take metformin during the during times of exercise, you negate the exercise thing. And so some people have um, basically. Uh, don't take metformin during times that they exercise. And for me, that is most of the week anyway. Uh, I never switch back and forth, but you could see in the longevity space, you, you're either going to be um, one of the, you know, if you're in the longevity space and, and, and you're doing all the fringe things, recognize that you're probably one going to be spending a lot of money on supplements or any of these things. There's very little data that's out there and that you're probably going to be a guinea pig. So um, that's all exciting. And I know some people are re really in into it. I, I dabble on things a little bit. I would probably say my main message for the people out there, if you want optimal health, longevity, and peak performance, is work on those seven things. Those seven things are free. Those seven things are just a way of living life. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned free because the, the knock on well-being and longevity specifically is it's really expensive and I don't have the time and I don't want to be a guinea pig for all this stuff. And, and, and I'm glad you mentioned hormesis, specifically intermittent fasting and cold therapy because they don't cost anything. Eating less doesn't cost anything. You could hack cold therapy. You don't need a special device or a special cold plunge pool or tub you can use a cold shower and you know as you think about hormesis and autophagy and the role plays in longevity like how do you rank of all the things all the free things that that don't take a lot of time and, and don't cost a lot of money or any money at all where do you get your, your biggest return on investment is it cold therapy is it if how do you think about those oh okay i don't well, I mean, it, you know, where do you get your bang for your buck or all the all the free things? Because why, if you divide, you know, anything by zero, it's an infinite return, right? Because it's free. Um, so you're going to get most bang for your buck that way, which is why I'm, I'm letting people know that you are your best medicine. If you work on those seven things, don't worry about not being able to afford um, some of these other things just yet. Um, and I would probably say what do you get the most bang for your buck? I would probably say one thing is, is also free and it's really building awareness. 
if you can build more awareness in your life to have a tactical pause before you do anything, you can really sort of direct the life that you want to live. Uh, I'll, I'll go in a little bit deeper on this, you know. When I was, you know, when I was the, the, the kid growing up and not feeling like enough, you know, I was constantly just like reacting to the world. Like I needed something on the outside to make me worthy. I was running from this, this place and everybody has a version of, of this autopilot mode. So we learn things, you know, we breathe, we, we digest and your mind isn't even thinking of it. And then we do other things. We've learned things from, from, from culture, from our parents that you know life is a certain way and, and and that becomes the autopilot it becomes our matrix so to speak and we can react to different things in our life through this matrix but we could always pause and we were able to take a po tactical pause and say oh oh man i'm craving that cookie right now but that's not really good for me um can i can i drink some sparkling water instead can i just go for a walk instead and not do that boom you, you just made a decision towards your health. And I believe that people are, you know, a, a little bit hypnotized and living in this matrix um, of, of how they're living life. And, and that way of living is really creating disease. So, but if you can work on that, this tactical pause, you know, are you, I created this, this one little, um, one little practice that I do uh, based on uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, quote. Viktor Frankl, as many people know, uh, wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He was a Holocaust survivor, um, seen so much death and destruction, you know, uh, with family and friends while he was in the uh, Holocaust camps. And he still had this to say. He said, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose a response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. Can we create that space? That's something that's very beautiful that I, I've done, you know, with my fiance. I mean, when we get into these modes where we're about to battle each other and, and like really kind of scream at each other, like, man, that's the reaction. That's what we, that, that's what we, you know, are, are, you know, are created to, to react to. But building the space, like pausing, oh my God, okay, well, she's reacting. I'm getting a lot of bad words thrown my way right now. I'm getting a lot of things thrown my way. Can I pause and just say, and not react to that and go, oh, where's the trigger? Where's the pain? And then in that space, I act, which is have awareness, choice, and then take action. Have the awareness that, oh my God, we're, we're in a reactive space. I can pause. What's happening here? Okay. We're, re you know, she's reacting this, to this trigger. Oh, okay. That I know that thing about her past that's coming up. Choose. I choose to show up with love. I choose to show up with connection. I'm like, babe, oh my, I'm sorry I said that. I'm right here. How can I be there for you? And then take action. And this is how, if we can do that with those seven areas of our life, when it comes to our sleep, our nutrition, our movement, our emotions, our, our, our mindset, our, our relationship, and that sense of purpose, that's the true power there. So if I could, you know, have one thing that, you know, that I would say is the ultimate thing is really create that space because in that space is who you create yourself to be and who you can make conscious choices and the res and the results that we have in our life in our relationship and our health and and in our businesses is basically all those choices strung together they could either be reactive or they could be conscious and so you know um creating more consciousness and awareness in your life is free and i would say that is the 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 most bang for your buck i love it i love it very practical we can all benefit from that i think the world needs that right now uh i don't need to say any more on that so in i'm curious with regards to all the science you follow the studies is there anything you're particularly excited about that that maybe just came out or you're watching closely that you're, you're that people can really benefit from yeah, um, I would probably say what I've done is um, look at how people have lived their life. And if I can sort of scientifically prove that it makes a, a change in your DNA, people would be like, oh, wow, yeah, that's true now. And so when Elizabeth Blackburn came up, you know, and it had her book Telomeres, I really studied it and say, wow, yeah, how you live your life it actually affects that. 
And then, then we've got, you know, that CTRA response. And now there's, um, there are clocks that actually measure our biological age and, and not our chronological age. I just ce celebrated my 44th birthday, but on these epigenetic clocks, I'm in my 30s. And so, um, you know, one of the things I'm excited about and I'm working closely with them is studying, again, how we live our life and how they affect that, you know, um, uh, epigenetic or, or biological age. And it's amazing to see that basically within our DNA is almost kind of the Rosetta Stone of how human beings should live. And human beings should be sleeping, should be moving, should be enjoying, enjoying life with each other and helping each other and freely giving so that our whole entire planet and humanity can evolve. Um, and when we live in that way, we're gifted with longevity and optimal health. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. Ken, thanks so much. You got it.